I'm going to start off with a little intro to some recent work at Ulster University, which sort of explains the angle which I've taken in this paper. So in 2020, myself and colleagues were awarded a research grant on the theme of museums and crisis. And our funding was part of UK research and innovation response to COVID-19. And the purpose of our research was to consider what museums could contribute as we navigated the impacts of the pandemic. Post-pandemic, this question of what museums can do during a crisis remains relevant as we witness the impacts of climate change, the cost of living crisis and conflict in Europe and beyond. And when I wrote that, I didn't know what was going to happen last night. And I think of my paper arising from our ashes. I didn't think we literally would have ashes on the street uh, this morning. So this notion of the usefulness of culture underpinned the exhibition movements of the mid 19th century. The sociologist Tony Bennett refers to the establishment of the South Kensington Museum in London and the Department of Science and Art as the multiplication of culture's utility. So when I was invited to contribute to this conference, I was inspired to consider the relevance of an event 170 years ago to how we engage in museums today. I suggest exploring its contribution to the idea of culture's utility is worthy of our analysis. So looking at 1853, we can consider the utility of such a spectacle when Ireland was emerging from the famine. And we also the ex, we can also think about the exhibition movement at this time and the institutions that stemmed from it as an opportunity to reimagine the nation and elevate its people through industrial progress. Using the great temple of art and industry as our starting point to think about the use value of museums, we must reflect upon how much of our thinking about museum purpose is connected to that 19th century notion of the museum. So in this presentation that follows, I will be sharing statements about the 1853 exhibition as a site of learning, a place of ambition and an opportunity to transform ourselves. So like others we've heard from today, in my exploration of the exhibition, I turned to the Irish newspaper archive. And looking across the newspapers, I would like to consider three narratives which reveal the use and the purpose of the exhibition. And these are summed up in this uh, quote, which is referring to, which is another description of the exhibition. And I think that there's key words in this quote that I think are really key. So this person is describing poor Ireland is again arising from her ashes and there cannot be a more consoling proof of the genius and the skill and the undiminished energies of her people than the spirit of industrial progress. So this one description for me sums up the three themes that I'm going to be looking at uh, in my slideshow, recovery, genius and progress. And this slideshow is mostly quotes from the newspapers. And for any of you who have read the 19th century newspapers, the use of language is just so fabulous. Uh, I think it was worthy of being on the slideshow. So that's why I've used quite so much text. You don't have to read it all. I'm just going to read out a few key phrases as we go through. But all of this, I think, sums up to the spirit of ambition. Whether they realise the ambition is not so much the concern of my paper, but has been touched on in other papers. But my intention is to have a look at what they wanted to do with this. What did they want to achieve? And how much of that has rubbed off uh, in the, the decades and the centuries since in how we think of the ambition for our museums. So that's kind of how it all links. So uh, looking first to that narrative of recovery, so I've got lots of little snippets here for, for you to have uh, a look at. So coming so soon after the famine, its supporters presented both the 1852 Cork exhibition and the Dublin exhibition as inspiration and evidence that Ireland was on the road to recovery. 
So the mayor of Cork talking about the Dublin exhibition talks about it as fostering a new hope and new energy. In the Illustrated Magazine of Art, they refer to Ireland as lately risen from the slough of famine. And the Freeman's Journal writes of our much maligned country and the hope of growing posterity. So there was a real clear vision of hope associated uh, with the coverage of the famine. So here, this, this is the Mayor of Cork talking about the Cork exhibition. So he talks about, he published um, a volume on the Cork exhibition that came out in May 1853. And I wonder whether it was a little bit of a reminder to Dublin that Cork got there first. So he said the reason why he wanted to produce this record was because what I saw of Irish genius, Irish capacity and Irish energy and Irish improvability was worthy of record. So he talks about uh, the sense of recovery. He talks about the power of this country to raise itself out of the slough of despond into which calamity and misfortune has plunged it. He talks about the aid of manufacturing industry, that it must be called in. And I, I think it's interesting the way he associates it with this ancient nation needs to be saved from utter extinction by using the power of industry. So combining the, the language of Irish nation building at the time with the language of progress and industrialization. And also an interesting point about why we should remember uh, the Cork exhibition. And he says, it's not my intention to refer to the history of the past. So he's, he, he doesn't want to talk about the famine. He says, my desire is to dwell upon the present and speculate on the future. So as, as it has already been said today, this is a future looking project. So in these sources, and this is um, the rather handsome uh, mayor of Cork. Uh, so in these sources, no direct reference is made to the scale of or the responsibility for the recent devastation across rural Ireland. So slightly polite turning away from what's just happened uh, in Ireland. Instead, the exhibition is a moment of transformation. Maguire frames this as inspiring confidence and banishing prejudice. And I think this is a really important statement for me and one I, I refer to it again in the conclusion. But I think it's just a really important moment for framing what is the purpose of a big public exhibition that we bring people into. And here he's talking about the, the confidence and the prejudice, I've, banishing prejudice, as I've just said, but also give employment, diminish poverty, uh, promote happiness, elevate the moral and physical conditions and encourage native industry. Those that I've marked out, um, those we still talk about museums and culture and arts in those terms. Um, and I don't, I'm not saying this is the first reference to this, but it's an early one. Um, so, uh, um, so I think this is, is just so interesting for that sense of purpose and confidence that the people behind these exhibitions wanted to nurture in Ireland. So to the theme of genius. So I have a number of slides on this theme of genius, but as you go through the sources, there's lots of use of that word Irish genius. Um, combined with Irish genius was a reference to the people who, um, who was being represented in it. So the, the people who built this building, the people who created the, the objects of industry that were inside this building. So it was a recognition of the capability amongst the Irish people. So here it's described as executed by Irish hands and perfected by Irish industry. So again, this sense of building up the confidence of Ireland post famine and combining this with sort of the nation building of the time. So here in the Anglo-Celt, they describe it, uh, our great industrial exhibition as an event over which Irish men may indeed exult. So all of this really important for sort of reinventing a sense of Ireland and a sense of Ireland's greatness. 
The Illustrated magazine of art calls it a proud reflection for Irish men, evidences of skills by a means entirely of their own. So a sense of that independence and ability found on the island. And I think this is really important coming out of the famine when confidence could well be at an all time low in Ireland. And also when we talk about managing the narrative, you know, maybe what the newspaper coverage is doing, it's managing a narrative. It wants to shape the perceptions other people have of Ireland by just reading the coverage. They may not get to the exhibition, but if they can read the coverage or have the coverage read to them, a sense of pride could build. So here we see this in the Nation magazine. And, and some of you here in this room may have read this already in, in preparation for today. A splendid temple of art and industry. The display will be credible to Irish genius and Irish craft, rich in artistic skill, rich in pictorial and scientific collections. Nowhere has science more daring and successful votaries. Nowhere has mechanical skill more accomplished workmen. This exhibition will stimulate the creative spirit, which is so common a characteristic of our people. Now, this doesn't have to be accurate, as we all know, but it has to sell an image of what the Irish people are. Or you could say we are all geniuses. So I'm quite happy to, to buy up for that one. But um, we also need to combine this with, um, like, I've, in preparation, I went back to Jan Janan Sheehy's book, The Rediscovery of Ireland's Past, and she writes about a sense in the early 19, or the early 1800s of the Irish people being written about as people who do, do not naturally express themselves in art and do not possess aesthetic appreciation of painting, sculpture, architecture and the like. So if that was the prevailing opinion at that period, the, the exhibition was the moment to reverse that. And John Hutchison, in his uh, discussion of nationalism in Ireland, talks about building the golden age and establishing the creative genius of the nation. And this really is a the coverage of the exhibition really is a contribution to that. So now I would like to move to the Academy collections. We have to mention them when we're in this room. And as others have mentioned already at this conference, one of the differences between the Dublin exhibition and that in London was the inclusion of a fine collection, as the quote, of ancient and modern paintings and a museum of Irish antiquities. So in this decision, Dublin followed Cork, which also displayed antiquities collections from the Academy and paintings to provide what they called in Cork the first national display of Irish art. But in Dublin, the antiquities gallery in the exhibition contained nearly the whole of the Museum of the Royal Irish Academy, which this British magazine describes as a series of national relics of the greatest value putting a blush, no, do I have that quote? Maybe I didn't put that quote in. Putting a blush to our English doings in this department. So they're saying that they're doing it much better in Dublin. So amongst these collections, and this is the description in the, the coverage in that magazine, they describe torques, bracelets, brooches, rings, boule, boxes, discs, and other ornaments. The native gold of which these ornaments are composed of is very rich in color. Such a splendid collection of golden ornaments as we apprehend perfectly unique. The account moves on to describe the Cross of Kong, the Gospel books, handbells, shrines, and the Tara brooch ornamented with intricate interlaced patterns, their description. There's also, and they list, flint arrowheads, celts, hammers, knives, daggers, swords, hatchets, spears, trumpets, handbells, rings, horse furniture. This list, the way they list it, just gives a sense of the volume that they are projecting out to their readers. And they describe these as a character quite unlike that of any other nation. So the contributor then goes on, um, yes, on this quote here, um, as they go on to talk about the regret that um, the skills in such craftsmanship has been lost in Ireland. 
Um, and they, they talk about the early Christian Ireland and they say during this period, the arts must have flourished in Ireland in a wonderful manner. Whence these early Christian artificers obtained their skill is a marvel. How they've lost it is a regret and a reproach both to Ireland and to England, which it is hoped that the year 1853 will begin to wipe away. So they're asking for the 1853 exhibition to reverse uh, centuries of loss of, of craft, of art and of industry. So even if we think this is absolutely impossible to happen, the fact that the aspiration has been written uh, for their readers is significant for projecting uh, what the purpose of the exhibition uh, could be. This was, is one of my favourite uh, descriptions of the antiquities galleries. And this is uh, Richard Hitchcock, who is a librarian. Um, and this is written in the transactions of the Kilkenny Archaeological Society. And I'll read it out to you because as any museum curator will tell you, they would love this sort of reaction from any modern day visitor into their galleries. And he describes his feelings. And I, I think this is so interesting because there's a lot of literature being written in museum studies about emotion and museums now. And they're writing about now, but this is a perfect example of somebody emotionally moved amongst uh, the antiquities collection. My feelings when wandering amongst the immense number of precious relics by which I was surrounded in the antiquarian court of our great exhibition. They seem to me like the fragrant flowers of some beautiful garden, whilst I, as it were, imbibed the sweets. At other times I felt transported with thought, and who, let me as with anything of a heart in his bosom, could look on the various objects of antiquity around him and not think. For my own part, I could have spent entire days and nights among the treasures of ancient Irish art exhibited within the walls of that glorious temple to industry. Like fabulous uh, description uh, there. So that just tells us, you know, what uh, one reaction um, uh, on the collections within collected in that area. So now I'll move to the theme of progress and recovery. A.C. Davis tells us that the exhibition movement needs to be understood in the context of the wildly held belief that industrial exhibitions somehow caused economic growth through increased tourism, trade and the exchange of information and ideas. An opportunity rests in the powers of industry. Railway expansion provided both the wealth and the rationale for the exhibition, which through its displays made the case for further industrialisation. As Turpin says, without the railway boom, Dargan would not have had the money to spend on the exhibition. And as we've already heard from Professor Liam Kennedy, the exhibition was developed in the shadow of the famine. And it can be seen as a moment of reinvention, a shift from what Emily Mark Fitzgerald has described as the horrors and the shame of the famine. The Freeman's Journal writes about the exhibition in relation to our much maligned country, a reference to the suffering of the past decade, but sees the exhibition as evidence of great improvements and more prosperous condition. John Turpin described the exhibition movement of the period as it was the first large scale propaganda effort on behalf of Irish industry, with the hope that Irish industry could save the country where, our, where agriculture had failed. In the coverage exhibition, there are discrete references made to the value of industry as a response to the destitution of the past decade. Direct reference to the decline in manufacturing employment, as well as the stark difference between the evidence of industry in Ireland and England, was not the purpose of an art and industrial exhibition. Rather, the exhibition did what many museums continued to do, perhaps right up to recent times, it glossed over the real and lived experience of many. In response to seeing the lace on display, the contributor, sorry, I'm stopping my timer, <laughs> bad sign, <laughs> I'm going to start it again. 
In response to seeing the lace on display, the contributor to the Illustrated Magazine of Art writes of the delicate tracery, which the, the person writes, speaks touchingly and hopefully of the miseries relieved and of intellectual and moral faculties developed. Here, the lace industry is seen as a lever for bettering the general condition of the peasantry. So they did go round the collections and look at it as a, as a means of progress and change. Also, I think important for us in connection with the theme of progress is that of patriotism. And it's already been referred to in the relation to William Dargan. And in the newspaper coverage, he's called a child of industry, a brother of the people. The patriotism of an Irish man um, working for the good of his country, a distinguished patriot. What I think is interesting in the first quote is they talk about how because he is a brother of the people that only a brother of the people could do something as fabulous as this. That this was an exhibition that didn't come from a titled descendant or a bannered knight or belted peer. It came from an, a, a person of the people and that was important point being made here uh, in sort of in the growing uh, nationalism of the 19th century. So the exhibition, and I don't expect you to read on the right, but the exhibition here in this source, uh, which is Jones's record of the Great Industrial Exhibition, he was the chief financer for the exhibition. He talks about it as a glorious effort for great national good, that Dargan is one of Ireland's benefactors. And he describes the tens of thousands of intelligent persons scrutinizing with, with anxious zeal the chaste and scientific specimens of artistic skill. So here we see the beginnings of talking about museum audiences, what people do when they come into a museum space, or at least what they want people to do, how they expect people to behave in this public space. So this is an example of us training the public of how to be in a cultural space, how to be an exhibition visitor. This is the new way of coming together to experience arts and culture, which is handpicked by the people of the establish, establishment with what was thought then as the necessary learning and taste. So now I'm just going to move to my just final few slides. Um, so here, this slide here, in refer to audi in reference to audiences, this is this slide and the next is both from the Freeman's Journal, and here they're lamenting um, the the audiences that they don't think are the right people at this point inside the exhibition, and they are criticising the fact that the exhibition is full of the rich and the fashionable. And I think this is interesting in reference to the previous paper about pricing uh, for getting into the conference. And they are maligning these people by saying that these people have nothing better to do, that they're, you know, they don't work, so they're just moving around listlessly in search of pleasure, which the absence of occupation gives them. They're excitement seeking, and they're not the classes for whom industrial exhibitions were mainly designed. So I think this, again, is a really important point about trying to establish an audience for an exhibition. Instead, they're saying here, it is a sealed book <clears throat> to that class for whose benefit and instruction it was designed by the greater captain of industry to whom its origin it's, is due. It, this was seeing the exhibition as being a school for the sons of toil. So this is the beginning of believing this is a place of education where we bring the working classes into this space um, to experience this exhibition rather than these, uh, these listless uh, people. So, um, and this very much ties back to Dargan by seeing Dargan as somebody who, ex who witnessed the famine and saw the great exhibition movement as a means for trying to turn Ireland around. Um, and this was an appeal for those audiences to be allowed into the exhibition. And we, we see that did happen towards the end. So turning now to uh, the significance and legacies to truly understand the impact of the Dublin exhibition, we need to consider it as part of a wider influence. 
the exhibition movement had a profound impact on ideas of the public. The 19th century saw a growing idea of a public that could be an ordered crowd, and those are quotes from Tony Bennett. Um, during this period, we saw the rise of public ownership and legislation around the preservation of sites and monuments, and, the, and art and antiquities moving into collections belonging to the public, provided for public benefit. The National Museums of Britain and Ireland were born from this movement. Not only here in Dublin, in the 1880s, profits from the International Exhibition of Science and Art in Glasgow were used to construct the Kelvin Grove Museum. This period also marked the birth of the Universal Museum. This was a time of mass spectacle and display and great exhibitions that provided a vision of the world in one space. This is a movement that created the idea of Universal Museum, one which could, at that time, reinforce empire. In the case, oh, sorry, I'll just move on to the next slide. So the, um, the point is also well made about um, the utility of public display came into its own right with the exhibition movement. Display at that scale in Ireland at the time of economic and political challenge was highly intentional. Those who were key to the realisation of the exhibition had ambition for what it would do for Ireland. And that ambition was a combination of contributing to the immediate recovery of Ireland post famine, to celebrate the capacity and genius of the Irish people and to look for, to the future for longer term progress on the Ireland island. The American sociologist, uh, Jeffrey Olick, tells us that the past makes the present. And this is most evident in our urge to commemorate, to mark significant past moments with cultural processes, such as exhibitions and events and symposia. The fact that we are gathered here is an indication that we put a value on the exhibition of 1853 as pivotal and lasting. But how does the past of 1853 make our present? I think we all appreciate the legacy of the 1853 Art and Industrial Exhibition is far more than the bricks and mortar that followed in the form of the public institutions. There are practices and approaches stemming from that period still evident in how we position and frame our museums. The legacy we must reflect upon is more about the attitudes that have lasted, that have positioned museums in our society. And that includes attitudes towards the purpose of public spaces, as places of interpretation and display, especially those places we assign authority. A further legacy is around how we frame public life, the establishment of principles of public duty, which is embedded in how we engage others with museums. And what we understand to be the public benefit or value of culture, arts and museums. And all of that can be combined with William Dargan's comments, comments about William Dargan, uh, John Maguire's comments. All of that reflects back. Each of these informs who we think museums are for, the authority that we give audiences, and the question of museum relevance and how that is framed. My final slide. When I was last invited to speak in this building, it was at the Roundtable event, Museums in Ireland Policies for the Future, which was in November 2019. That event happened only months before the COVID-19 pandemic that changed work and family life, as well as the catastrophic impacts on health and well-being. To return to the Academy buildings post-pandemic, when the world is still very much in crisis, climate, cost of living and war, we must continue to address the significance and positioning of the three areas that I've mentioned before, public space, public duty, public benefit. As observed by Lynn Scarf, uh, the idea of the museum, which is in the report on the left most, the idea of the museum that emerged from the 19th century was one that sustained and is only now 
with changes in social and political systems that we are reimagining the museum for the 21st century. So she talks about how that 19th century notion of the museum continued right up into the mid 20th century. Post pandemic, we are increasingly looking to museums as a place of recovery where we can demonstrate resilience. The sense of public ethos and community connectedness means that striving for the museum as a place that influences change is a motive that underpins practice across the sector. So in 1853, John Maguire spoke about public exhibitions in terms of inspiring confidence. These are his words again, banishing prejudice, diminishing poverty, promoting happiness. 170 years later, with our significant changes in political and legislative frameworks, what might those aspirations mean for our public institutions today? Thank you very much.